Hello everyone, got a bunch of jokes about politics for you today. So a priest was being honored at his retirement dinner after 25 years in the parish. A leading local politician and member of the church was chosen to make the presentation and to give a little talk at the dinner. However, he was delayed, so the priest decided to say his own few words while they waited. I got my first impression of the parish from the first confession I heard here. I thought I had been assigned to a terrible place. The very first person who entered my confessional told me he had stolen a television set and, when questioned by the police, was able to lie his way out of it. He had stolen money from his parents, embezzled from his employer, had an affair with his boss's wife had screwed with his boss's 17-year-old daughter on numerous occasions, taken illegal drugs, had several affairs, was arrested several times for public nudity and gave VD to his sister-in-law. I was appalled that one person could do so many awful things. But as the days went on, I learned that my people were not all like that, and I had, indeed, come to a fine parish full of good and loving people. Just as the priest finished his talk, the politician arrived full of apologies at being late. He immediately began to make the presentation and gave his talk. I'll never forget the first day our parish priest arrived, said the politician. In fact, I had the honor of being the first person to go to him for confession. <laughs> So Putin is sitting in his office when his telephone rings. Hello, Mr. Putin, a heavily accented voice said. This is Patty Down at the Harp Pub in County Clare, Ireland. I am ringing to inform you that we are officially declaring war on you. Well, Patty, Putin replied, this is indeed important news. How big is your army right now, says Patty. After a moment's calculation, there is myself, me cousin Sean, my next door neighbor Seamus, and the entire darts team from the pub. That makes eight. Putin paused. I must tell you, Petty, that I have 100,000 men in my army waiting to move on my command. Bigora, says Patty. I'll have to ring you back. Sure enough, the next day, Patty calls again. Mr. Putin, the war is still on. We have managed to get us some infantry equipment. And what equipment would that be, Patty? Putin asks. Well, we have two combines, a bulldozer, and Marfi's farm tractor. Putin sighs amused. I must tell you, Petty, that I have 6,000 tanks and 5,000 armored personnel carriers. Also, I have increased my army to 150,000 since we last spoke. Saints preserve us, says Petty. I'll have to get back to you. Sure enough, Patty rings again the next day. Mr. Putin, the war is still on. We have managed to get ourselves airborne. We have modified Jackie McLaughlin's ultralight with a couple of shotguns in the cockpit, and four boys from the Shamrock Bar have joined us as well. Putin was silent for a minute and then cleared his throat. I must tell you, Patty, that I have 100 bombers and 200 fighter planes. My military bases are surrounded by laser-guided surface-to-air missile sites. And since we last spoke, I have increased my army to 200,000. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, says Patty, I will have to ring you back. Sure enough, Patty calls again the next day. Good morning, Mr. Putin. I am sorry to inform you that we have had to call off the war. Really? I am sorry to hear that, says Putin. Why the sudden change of heart? Well, says Patty, we had a long chat over a few pints of Guinness and finally decided there's no way we can feed 200,000 Russian prisoners. <laughs> So a man walked into the ladies' department of a Macy's, shyly walked up to the woman behind the counter and said, quietly, I'd like to buy a bra for my wife. What type of bra? asked the clerk. Type, inquires the man, a bit out of his element. There's more than one type. Look around, said the sales lady, as she showed him a sea of brass in every shape, size, color, and material imaginable. Actually, even with all of this variety, there are really only three main styles of brass to choose from, said the sales lady. The soldier, the judge, or the politician. Which would you prefer? Now befiddled, the man asked about the differences between them. The sales lady responded, well, it's quite simple. The soldier defends strategic location from foreign hands. The judge makes sure everything is equal and balanced. 
and the politician blows everything out of proportion. <laughs> so three explorers became lost in the jungle and wandered for days with no food and little water. One day, just as they were finally about to give up, they crawled into a clearing and there right in front of them stood a cannibal's restaurant. Out front near the entrance was a large menu board. With the little energy they had left, they dragged themselves across the clearing and looked up to see the following menu. They struggled into the establishment, dragged themselves to a table, and a waiter came to take their order. Before they ordered, one of the explorers asked the waiter, can you help me understand your menu? The first two items are priced about the same, but the third item, the politician, is priced so much higher. Why is that? Are you kidding? replied the waiter. Did you ever try to clean one of those dirty suckers? <laughs> so a father is lecturing his son about the importance of a good education. Dad, what's the difference between a man with a college degree and a man without? said the son. Well son, said the father, you can perform the same job, but the outcome will vary depending if you have a college degree or not. How so? asked the son. You see, if you rob a man without a college degree, you will be prosecuted as a criminal and sent to jail. What if I rob a man after I received a college degree? asked the son. In that case, they will address you as special agent of the IRS. <laughs> So a politician, an oil baron, and their pilot crash in the middle of the ocean. They eventually end up on an island, and the three decide to split up and meet back at the beach at sunset. When they meet back up, the politician returned with four fish, the oil baron found what he needed to build an open fire, and the pilot found a mysteriously sealed bottle. With each man getting their one fish, the politician was going to grab the last fish when the oil baron slapped his hand. They got into an argument, with the politician believing since he spent all day catching fish, he deserved his extra. The oil baron disagreed and said that he supplied the material needed to cook the fish and so it should be his. The conflict escalated, and as they were about to start a fistfight, the pilot sat back and was nervously rubbing his bottle. All of a sudden, the bottle's cork flew off, and a huge green genie appeared in front of them, muscular arms crossed in front of him. You have freed me, weary traveler. He booms at the pilot. I was dropped in the middle of the ocean centuries ago, and now, to thank you, I shall give you three wishes as is custom. The pilot stopped the genie and asked if instead of giving him three wishes if he could give each of them one, with which the genie generously agreed. The pilot has thought about this before, and he was going to say his wish, but out of fury, the politician pointed at the oil baron and spit out, I wish all greedy people like him would disappear. The genie laughed and was going to grant the wish until the oil baron said, well I wish all power hungry people like him disappeared. The genie looked concerned and so asked the pilot for his wish. Thinking for a few minutes, the pilot then tells the genie I'd like my plane fixed, good as new. All three look at the pilot, confused by his modest wish. You can ask for anything. Why would you only wish for that, says an astonished politician. Well, I was going to wish for world peace, said the pilot, but you two seem to have taken care of that. <laughs> so a man is lying in the hospital waiting to be the first person in history to receive a brain transplant. A doctor comes in and says, congratulations, but unfortunately since this is a new procedure, your insurance isn't going to cover it all. So we're going to give you three choices for brains and you can decide which you can afford. Okay, what are they? Says the man to the doctor. The doctor says, well, first there's engineer brain, that's $100 an ounce. Then there's astrophysicist brain, that'll cost you $200 an ounce. Finally there's politician brain, that's the most expensive at $1,000 an ounce. The man looks at the doctor, surprised, that's absurd. Why is the politician brain so expensive? The doctor turns to him and says, sir, do you have any idea how many politicians it takes to get an ounce of brain? <laughs> So two crocodiles were sitting at the side of the river. After a few hours just lying about, the smaller one turned to the bigger one and said, 
I can't understand how you can be so much bigger than me. We're the same age, we were the same size as kids, I just don't get it. Well, said the big croc, what have you been eating? Well, mostly politicians that come here with their mistresses, same as you, replied the small croc. Hum. Well, where do you catch them? On the other side of the river near the car park. Same here. Tell me your method. How do you catch them? Asked the big croc. Well, I crawl up under one of their big Lexus, BMW or Mercedes cars and wait for one to unlock the car door. Then I jump out, grab them by the leg, shake the crap out of them and eat them. Ah, says the big crocodile. I think I see your problem. You're not getting any real nourishment. See, by the time you finish shaking the crap out of a politician, there is nothing much left but an asshole with a briefcase. <laughs> so three kids are talking about their fathers and comparing them. First kid says, my dad is the fastest. He's a drag racer and can do a quarter mile in 9.6 seconds. Second kid says, that's nothing. My dad is a fighter pilot and regularly breaks the speed of sound. Third kid says, my dad is faster than both your dads. He's a congressman. He finishes work at 4 o'clock, but is always home by lunchtime. <laughs> so a man walks into an antique store and starts looking around. Suddenly, he gazes upon the most stunning bronze statue of a Siamese cat. He asks the store owner how much he wants for the statue. The store owner replies it's $200 for the statue and $2,000 for the story that goes with it. The man replies I really don't care about the story, but I do want the statue. As the man is paying for the statue, the shop owner says all right, but I guarantee you will be back for the story. The man walks out of the shop and starts down the street carrying the cat's statue. When he comes to the crosswalk, he happens to glance behind him and sees three or four cats sitting about 10 feet away, looking at him. He shrugs it off and crosses when the light changes. He goes several more blocks and, at another crosswalk, looks behind himself again. This time there are about 30 cats sitting there looking at him. The man starts to get a little nervous and picks up his pace when the light changes. By the time the man reaches the pier at the end of the street, he has now been running for several blocks. He was running because every time he turned around, there were more and more cats behind him. He looked like the Pied Piper. When he got to the end of the pier, he turned around once more and saw at least 2,000 cats sitting there looking at him. There were so many cats that there was no way to get off the pier without going through them and he knew there was no way he was going to do that. In a panic, he turned toward the water and heaved the statue as far as he could. Amazingly, all of the cats ran right past him and jumped in the water after the statue and never came out. The man, still shaking from his ordeal, immediately started running back to the shop. As he burst through the door, the shop owner saw him and said, I told you that you'd be back for the story. To heck with the story, gasped the man, do you have a statue of a politician? <laughs> So one of the Russian ambassadors comes to President Putin and nervously tells him he'd like to resign. Why? Putin asks him. Ah, uh, Mr. President, I can't find myself with these time differences. I fly to another city, call home and everyone is asleep. I last woke you up at 4 in the morning, but I thought it was only evening. I call Angela Merkel to congratulate her on her birthday and she tells me she had it yesterday. I wish the Chinese president a happy new year, and he says it will be tomorrow. Well, these are just minor inconveniences, says Putin. Do you remember when that Polish plane crashed with the president? I called them to express my condolences, but the plane hasn't taken off yet. <laughs> So the year is 2032 and the United States has elected the first woman as well as the first Jewish president, Sarah Goldstein. She calls up her mother a few weeks after election day and says, So, mom, I assume you'll be coming to my inauguration. I don't think so, replies her mom. It's a 10-hour drive, your father isn't as young as he used to be, and my arthritis is acting up again. So Sarah says, don't worry about it, mom, 
I'll send Air Force One to pick you up and take you home, and a limousine will pick you up at your door. Again, she says, I don't know. Everybody will be so fancy schmancy. What on earth would I wear? Sarah replies, I'll make sure you have a wonderful gown, custom made by the best designer in New York. Honey, mom complains, you know I can't eat those rich foods you and your friends like to eat. The president-to-be responds, don't worry mom, the entire affair is going to be handled by the best caterer in New York. Kosher all the way mom. I really want you to come. So mom reluctantly agrees and on January 20th, Sarah Goldstein is being sworn in as President of the United States. In the front row sits the new president's mother, who leans over to a senator sitting next to her and says, You see that woman over there with her hand on the Torah, becoming President of the United States? The senator whispers back, Yes, I do. Her mom flushes with pride and says, Her brother is a doctor. <laughs> so St. Peter was standing at the pearly gates of heaven when a group of politicians walked up. Hey Petey, may we come into heaven? Asks one jovially. St. Peter replies, well, we have never had a group of politicians come into heaven before, let me ask God. He then turns around and goes to consult God. My lord, there is a group of politicians at the pearly gates of heaven. Should I let them in? God thinks for a moment and says we have never had politicians in heaven before. Let's see how it goes. Let them in. St. Peter leaves God, only to come running back a few minutes later. They are gone, he said. The politicians, asks God. No, the pearly gates. <laughs> So while walking down the street one day, a high-ranking politician is tragically hit by a truck and dies. His soul arrives in heaven and is met by St. Peter at the entrance. Welcome to heaven, says St. Peter. Before you settle in, it seems there is a problem. We seldom see a high official around these parts, you see, so we're not sure what to do with you. No problem. Just let me in, says the politician. Well, I'd like to, but I have orders from high up. What we'll do is have you spend one day in hell and one day in heaven. Then you can choose where to spend eternity. Really? I've made up my mind. I want to be in heaven, says the politician. I'm sorry, but we have our rules. And with that, St. Peter escorts the politician to the elevator and he goes down, down, down to hell. The doors open and he finds himself in the middle of a green golf course. In the distance is a club and standing in front of it are all his friends and other politicians who had worked with him. Everyone is very happy and in evening dress. They run to greet him, hug him, and reminisce about the good times they had while getting rich at the expense of the people. They play a friendly game of golf and then dine on lobster and caviar. Also present is the devil, who really is a very friendly guy and has a good time dancing and telling jokes. They are having such a good time that, before he realizes it, it is time to go. Everyone gives him a big hug and waves while the elevator rises. The elevator goes up, 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 and the door reopens on heaven where St. Peter is waiting for him. Now it's time to visit heaven. So 24 hours pass with the politician head of state joining a group of contented souls moving from cloud to cloud, playing the harp and singing. They have a good time and, before he realizes it, the 24 hours have gone by and St. Peter returns. Well then, you've spent a day in hell and another in heaven. Now choose your eternity. He reflects for a minute, then the head of state answers. Well, I would never have thought it. I mean heaven has been delightful, but I think I would be better off in hell. So St. Peter escorts him to the elevator and he goes down, down, down to hell. Now the doors of the elevator open and he is in the middle of a barren land covered with waste and garbage. He sees all his friends dressed in rags, picking up the trash and putting it in black bags. The devil comes over to the politician and lays an arm on his neck. I don't understand, stammers the politician. Yesterday I was here and there was a golf course and club and we ate lobster and caviar and danced and had a great time. Now all there is a wasteland full of garbage and my friends look miserable. The devil looks at him, smiles and says, of course, yesterday we were campaigning. Today you voted for us. 
So once upon a time, there was a thief and a politician who were friends. One day, they entered a chocolate store. While they were busy looking around, the thief stole three chocolate bars. As they left the store, the thief said to the politician, Man, I'm the best thief ever. I stole three chocolates and no one saw me. You can't beat that. The politician replied, you want to see something better, let's go back to the shop and I'll show you real stealing. So they went to the counter and politician said to the shopkeeper, Hey do you want to see magic? The shopkeeper replied, Sure. The politician says, Give me one chocolate bar. The shopkeeper gave him one and he ate it. He asked for a second and he ate that as well. He asked a third and finished that one too. The shopkeeper asked, But where's the magic? The politician replied, check in my friend's pocket and you'll find it. <laughs> so a busload of politicians were driving down a country road one afternoon when all of a sudden the bus ran off the road and crashed into a tree in an old farmer's field. Seeing what happened, the old farmer went over to investigate. He then proceeded to dig a hole and bury the politicians. Somehow, some of the politicians survived and continued to plead for someone to rescue them from beneath the earth. A few days later, the local sheriff came out, saw the crashed bus, and asked the old farmer, were they all dead? Well, the old farmer replied with a thoughtful expression, some of them said they weren't, but you know how them politicians lie. <laughs> So a politician visited a village and asked what their needs were. We have two basic needs, honorable sir, replied the villager leader. Firstly, we have a hospital but no doctor. On hearing this, the politician brought out his phone. After speaking for a while, he told them not to worry. A doctor will be there tomorrow, and he asked for the second problem. The villagers replied, secondly, sir, there is no cell phone reception anywhere in this village. <laughs> So a politician, three doctors and three engineers decided to climb Mount Everest. They arrive there and start climbing the long way up the tallest climb on earth. It's a grueling climb and they have to stop many times to rest and pull each other up. Halfway into the climbing, the rope starts to break. The doctors say they should all hang on and wait for help. Nobody believes they will arrive on time. The engineers, with their quick physics skills, tell everyone one of us has to jump or else we all die. Nobody wanted to jump. Everyone held onto the rope with their hands tightly. Then, the politician let out a sigh. You people are valuable resources for the country. A doctor can save so many lives. An engineer can build so many innovative things. But what am I, a useless politician? What do I do for society? Nothing. I just give speeches and that's it. He gives out a very heartfelt sigh. The others were so touched, they all started clapping for the politician and fell down. <laughs> So three contractors are bidding to fix a broken fence at the White House in D.C. One from New Jersey, another from Tennessee, and the third, Florida. They go with a White House official to examine the fence. The Florida contractor takes out a tape measure and does some measuring, then works some figures with a pencil. Well, he says, I figure the job will run about $900. $400 for materials, $400 for my crew, and $100 profit for me. The Tennessee contractor also does some measuring and figuring, then says, I can do this job for $700, $300 for materials, $300 for my crew, and $100 profit for me. The New Jersey contractor doesn't measure or figure, but leans over to the White House official and whispers, $2,700. The official, incredulous, says, You didn't even measure like the other guys. How did you come up with such a high figure? The New Jersey contractor whispers back, $1,000 for me, $1,000 for you, and we hire the guy from Tennessee to fix the fence. Done, replies the government official. <laughs> So an important politician was seen moving around with a film actress for a couple of months, with whom he finally decided to plunge into Matt Ramone. But, being cautious, 
he hired a private detective for the job of looking into her past and finding out if she had any previous affairs with any men. After a few days, the politician at last received his detective's report, which went like this. Sir, this lady has a spotless reputation. Her past is clear, her family and friends all come from a very respectable background. No one has anything against her character. But yes, according to my sources, for the last couple of months she's been frequently seen flirting with a politician with a dubious reputation. <laughs> So three politicians become friends after meeting each other at functions. One is from America, the second from Russia, and the third from Brazil. The American politician decides to invite the two others to his home. When they get there, the first thing he shows them is his Rolls Royce. Beautiful, isn't it? He asks them. Um, yes it is, they both admit. Wanna know how I could afford to buy it? The American points in a direction. You see that bridge over there? 5% of its building funds went into my pockets. The other two smile and nod in understanding. A few weeks later, the Russian politician extends an invitation to the other two to come to his home for a party. When they arrive, the two were surprised at how grand it was. It was a regal-looking mansion. They asked the Russian politician, Where did you get the money to buy it from? The Russian takes them outside points in a direction and says, you see that huge bridge over there? I used inferior materials and got 20% of the costs stashed in my personal account. The other two are impressed. A few weeks later, the Brazilian politician extends an invitation to the other two to come to his home for dinner. When they arrive, the two are astonished to see a palatial mansion with a fleet of cars on the front driveway. How the heck did you get the money to get all this? asked the Russian. Do you see that bridge over there? pointed the Brazilian politician. No, said both, squinting in that direction. Exactly. <laughs> so a zoologist, a doctor, and a politician are kidnapped by an evil psychopath. The psychopath says I'm going to get each of you to hold a snake for 10 minutes, the most venomous snake in the world. If it doesn't bite you, I'll let you go. If you refuse, I'll shoot you. The zoologist approaches the snake carefully, then, using his knowledge, tries to grab the back of the snake's head. But the snake was quicker, and his hand got bit before it got two centimeters from the snake. He falls dead almost instantly. The doctor examines the snake, tries to find the best position to stop the snake from being uncomfortable, and holds it. The snake bites him, and he falls over dead. The politician is last up, he just mitters, screw it, and holds the snake. To his amazement, the snake stays still, it doesn't bite him. He holds it for a full 10 minutes and is set free. After he leaves, the psycho looks at the snake and says, why didn't you kill that last one? Professional courtesy, murmured the snake. <laughs> So one morning a blind bunny was hopping down the bunny trail, and he tripped over a large snake and fell right on his twitchy little nose. Oh, please excuse me, said the bunny. I didn't mean to trip over you, but I'm blind and can't see. That's perfectly all right, replied the snake. To be sure, it was my fault. I didn't mean to trip you, but I'm blind too, and I didn't see you coming. By the way, what kind of animal are you? Well, I really don't know, said the bunny. I'm blind, and I've never seen myself. Maybe you could examine me and find out. So the snake felt the bunny all over, and he said, Well, you're soft and cuddly, and you have long silky ears, and a little fluffy tail, and a dear twitchy little nose. You must be a bunny rabbit. Then he said, I can't thank you enough, but by the way, what kind of animal are you? And the snake replied that he didn't know, and the bunny agreed to examine him. When he was finished, the snake said, well, what kind of an animal am I? So the bunny felt the snake all over, and he replied, you're hard, you're cold, you're slimy, and you haven't got any balls. You must be a politician. <laughs> So once upon a time, the government had a vast scrapyard in the middle of a desert. Congress said, someone may steal from it at night. So they created a night watchman position and hired a person for the job. Then Congress said, how does the watchman do his job without instruction? So they created a planning department and hired two people 
one person to write the instructions, and one person to do time studies. Then Congress said, how will we know the night watchman is doing his tasks correctly? So they created the quality control department and hired two people, one to do the studies and one to write the reports. Then Congress said, how are these people going to get paid? So they created a timekeeper and a payroll officer position, then hired two people for the roles. Then Congress said, who will be accountable for all of these people? So they created an administrative section and hired three people, an administrative officer, assistant administrative officer, and a legal secretary. Then Congress said, we have had this command in operation for one year and we are $18,000 over budget. We must cut back on overall cost. So they laid off the night watchman. <laughs> So it was a celebratory mood with the boys at NASA. They had just made the scientific achievement of a lifetime. As they were uncorking a bottle of champagne, Dr. Lowenstein, the head scientist at NASA, asked everyone to be quiet as he had received a congratulatory phone call from the President of the United States. He picked up a special red phone and spoke into it. Mr. President, said Dr. Lowenstein, grinning broadly, after 12 years of hard research and billions of dollars spent, we have finally found intelligent life on Mars. He listened for a second, and his smile gradually disappeared, replaced by a frown. He said, but that's impossible. We could never do it. Yes, Mr. President, and hung up the phone. He addressed the crowd of scientists staring at him curiously. I have some bad news, he said. The president said that now that we've found intelligent life on Mars, he wants us to try to find it in Congress. <laughs> so it's been a long, long day, and John the truck driver really wanted to just get home. Living in Washington, D.C., he knew traffic would be bad this time of evening, but to his horror, a traffic jam reared ahead of him larger than anything he could have anticipated. Bewildered, since he hadn't heard anything yet on the news, he stuck his head out and just kept seeing cars slowing down and then driving off. Nothing was moving. Suddenly, a man knocks on the window. The driver rolls down the window and asks, what's going on? Terrorists have kidnapped the entire US Congress. Oh my gosh exclaimed John, and they're asking for a $100 million ransom. Jeez Louise, moaned John. Otherwise, they are going to douse them all in gasoline and set them on fire. Lord have mercy, cried John. We are going from car to car, collecting donations. How much is everyone giving on average, asked John. About a gallon. <laughs> so a rabbi, a Hindu priest, and a politician went on a hike. Night fell and they were exhausted. The hotel on the map was nowhere to be seen. They knocked on the door of a farm and asked if they could spend the night. The farmer said, of course, but I only have a small room with two beds. One of you will have to sleep in the barn. The Hindu priest said, I need no material comforts. I will gladly take the barn. The rabbi and the politician were settling in when they heard a knock on the door. They opened it to find the Hindu priest standing there. So sorry, my friends, but there is a cow in the barn, and I cannot sleep beside such a holy animal. The rabbi said, no problem, my brother, I'll take the barn. The Hindu priest and the politician were settling in when they heard a knock on the door. They opened it to find the rabbi standing there. So sorry, my friends, but there's a pig in the barn, and I can't sleep beside such a filthy animal. The politician said, okay, let it be remembered that I sacrificed my comfort for the greater good. The rabbi and the Hindu priest were settling in when they heard a knock on the door. They opened it to find the pig and the cow standing there. <laughs> so an American spy is in Soviet Russia, digging up information on a powerful Russian politician. He finds him in a bar, walks in dressed in Russian attire, pretending to be Russian. Everybody in the bar looks at him, but he keeps his cool. He orders a drink and walks to the politician. Greetings, comrade, says the spy, but before he could finish his sentence, the Russian says, 
I think you are American spy. The spy is alarmed, but being a skilled, trained spy, he says, that is not true. I am the proudest Soviet there is. I can sing the anthem more beautifully than any other man in the country. He then proceeds to sing the Soviet anthem so melodically and beautifully that everybody in the bar cheers. Very good, very good, says the politician. But I still think you are spy. The man continues to keep his cool. I am a historian. I can tell you everything about this glorious country. He then spends about two hours recounting the revolution, the great patriotic war, about how superior to the Russia is in terms of technology compared to America and makes a great argument about how communism is beneficial to society. Amazing. You are skilled, says the politician. The spy smirks. But I still think you American spy. The spy is getting frustrated, but still unfazed. He replies, I am good drinker, a true Russian. Let us drink and see who can come out top. The bar turns its attention to the politician and the spy, who are now in a drinking contest. The bartender serves drink after drink of vodka. After about an hour of drinking, the politician nearly passes out, unable to hold as much liquor as the spy to a resounding cheer amongst the bar. In the midst of the cheering, the Russian politician gets up, smiling, and in a slurred speech, repeats, you are good, you are good but I still think you are spy. The American spy, pissed drunk, loses his skill and gives up. Okay, you got me. I am an American. But what made you think that way after all this time? The Russian politician replies, there aren't many black people in Russia. <laughs> So high-ranking politicians visit a school. The top one goes over the expenses and decides to make adjustments to cut costs. The lunch portions are too big. Cut them in half. Internet connection too fast. Too many computers. After that, they go to a preschool. Again, the expenses are too great. The lunch portions are too big. Reduce them to half. Too many toys around. After the preschool, they go to a prison. The lunch portions are too small and the selection is too limited. Get faster broadband and more comfortable beds. TVs are too old. Get a few consoles as well. One of them asks the leader, baffled, are you mad? We just cut costs in schools and preschools and now you do this. My friend, replied the leader, we will never go to school or preschool again, but we can still easily end up here. <laughs>